before we get into our message today, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to read God's Word together. We're going to look at a subject that is something that comes up for every Christian and sometimes creates a bit of confusion, and we want to make sure that we're not confused, but that we are following the straight and narrow and going where Jesus wants us to go. We read God's Word together here, because the God's Word is meant to be read out loud, not just in our head. So first service did a good job. I trust that second service, you are ready for God's Word. Let's read it boldly, clearly. Here we go. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. All right, let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, we have read a very stark text, a very clear text. And I pray that that clear text can help us gain clarity as we talk about the subject of knowing what you would have us do with our lives. We all come from so many different backgrounds, whether socioeconomic or faith or or whatever and we have different experiences with you in church and and ultimately we are here because we want to hear from you holy spirit we want to sense what you are saying to our hearts and our minds not just in an abstract intellectual way but in a way that we can internalize and practice and live out so we can have the most peace and the most abundant life possible i thank you for everybody who is here holy spirit please guard our hearts and minds from distraction and anxiety and stress and worry and all the things that plague us so much during the week and help us just to enjoy this time together at church, uh, resting on the Sabbath day and worshiping together. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for being with us. In your name we pray. Amen. So beginning on July 1st, I embarked on a studying journey to prepare for this nightmarish exam that is happening in later September and then in early October, a written part and an oral part. And I can say confidently that after studying for a month, I have moved from panic to extremely concerned. It's progress. That's good. As I am reading things and reviewing things and, and learning things, there are things I feel like I could, I could talk about. For example, in the field of communication theory, you have the rhetorical tradition. Now, rhetoric originates with Corax of Syracuse, which is off the coast of Sicily. And the reason he got into rhetoric is because of a dictator that had taken everybody's lands away. He had to equip the people who would go to represent themselves in court to get their land back. So he developed these rhetorical arts. And then his student, Gorgias took that from Italy over to Greece. And Mike is very proud of that, by the way. Pastor Mike appreciates that point, that it was the Italians who brought rhetoric to Greece. And so Gorgias comes over. He gives rhetoric to the Greeks. And of course, he trains Isocrates and the Sophists and Plato with his dialectics and Aristotle with his rhetoric. His students get together, combine Aristotle's notes and produce the book rhetoric, which has things like pathos, ethos, and logos, which you study in basic speech classes. Later on, Romans show up. And so you've got a Roman named Cicero who creates the five canons of rhetoric. Quintilian shows up after him and he kind of refines the process a little bit. Rhetoric kind of falls out of, out of vogue with Christians until the 4th or 5th century. And then Augustine of Hippo comes along. He takes it in his book, De Doctrina, and he reintegrates it into hermeneutics and, and teaching the Bible as well as semiotics. He talks about natural and conventional signs. From there, you move to the Renaissance period and you've got people like Luther and Melanchthon and Erasmus and Ramus and they talk about rhetoric. And then you move more to the modern period where you end up with people like Lloyd Bitzer's rhetorical situation, Kenneth Burke, Dramatis Pentad. You've got Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm, which he suggests that we are homo nerens. We are people who are build our lives around stories. And then you end up with Foss and Griffin, who show up in the 90s, who talk about invitational rhetoric, which comes out of feminist theory. And this is just one sample of one line of thought from one communication theory in one class. And I have had to take many, many classes. And I share those with you, not to impress you, but to warn you. <laughs> Because this line of thinking, along with many, many others, are the kind of things I have to repeat in my brain for the next two months. So if you ask me anything about communication or rhetoric or media, I am more than happy to share with you if you are ready to receive it. <laughs> and I don't know that you are. <laughs> I also bring that up to create sort of a little meditation on information. Because whether you are in school studying for a nightmare exam or you're out of school and you are praising Jesus this morning that you don't have any more exams or, in my condolences, you are a student who is going back to school the next couple weeks because summer is ending, it doesn't matter. All of us, at some point or another, feel like we have way more information than we can process. Way more information than we know what to do with. 
I mean, just let's, let's think about just empirical data, for example. Empirical data, just the sensory data. How much sensory data are you processing right now? Think about touch. The feel of the cushion on your backside as you seat. The, the feel of the fibers, whatever you chose to wear today, however that, that fabric feels in your skin, you're processing. Think about what you're smelling. You might have a mint in your mouth. You might, you might smell the colognes and perfumes that are hovering around you that people decided to wear to church today. You might be sitting next to somebody who made some bold breakfast choices. <laughs> and, and the smell of garlic and onion is so strong you can taste it. <laughs> Think about what you can see. All the different colors, all the different shades that are happening right now. Think if you've got one, two screens. Maybe you have a third screen in your hand with all kinds of things you're looking at. Think of the text you're having to read. Think of that you're hearing my voice and you're hearing the breathing of the person next to you. You might hear the rustling of candy wrappers or someone digging through their purse. You have all kinds of sensory data happening all the time. It doesn't ever shut off. You are processing millions of pieces of data all the time. What happens is your imagination grabs a hold of that sensory data and it infuses it with meaning. It relates it to the images and experiences that you've had in the past and says, this is what this means. This is what this smell reminds us of. This is what this touch reminds us of. This is what this is. And it gives it over to the rational part of your brain and the rational part part of your brain takes all this meaning and sifts through to figure out what is true and that's how you hopefully live a true authentic blessed life there's a lot of information we can get information from from countless sources now but there's always one piece of information that for the sincere christian always seems to be a problem one piece of information that always seems incredibly elusive especially if you're a new christian and you're and you're just learning how to follow jesus and that piece of information is something we call the will of god God, what would you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What, what kind of decision should I make at this juncture? And what if I make the wrong decision? Is it going to blow up and mess up every other part of my life? What am I supposed to do? It reminds me of the game Minesweeper. I don't know if you ever, any of you ever played this game before. Minesweeper used to come with PCs. Maybe it still does. And it's a very simple kind of game, although it's tricky. The concept is simple. You have a board like this, all these tiles, and behind these tiles are one of two things, a number or a bomb. And your job is to pick the tiles, you might have already deduced this, that don't have a bomb. And so you click on a tile and you get something like this. And you can see here, those little flags represent where the person thinks the bombs are. And those numbers tell you how many bombs are touching that tile. So that tile, obviously there's one's, one tile and you got three, that means three bombs are touching that one. And the whole goal is to move through this board and, get, and flag all the mines and then you win. If you make a mistake, something like this happens. See, they're playing and they make a wrong choice. Oh, now look at that. Look at the devastation that happens. They totally blew it. Now this game can create a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of stress. And for some of us, if, if we are approaching discerning God's will as this idea that God might just have a very specific thing we're supposed to do and nothing else, it creates kind of the same stress as we experience playing Minesweeper. For some of us, this is what our life looks like. We kind of have this picture <laughs> that life is full of bombs and landmines and there is one tile that we have and we had better figure out what it is, otherwise everything is going to blow up. And if this is the way you process God's will, and I'm talking especially to my sincere earnest followers of Jesus, my ruminators. Where are you at, ruminators? Is he talking about me? Am I a ruminator? Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> what can happen if this is the way we view God's will as we experience what I call paralysis by analysis? Instead of moving and growing and living, and by the way, just to remind you, the Great Commission in the latter part of Matthew's Gospel starts out with the word what? Go. <laughs> But what happens is we get so fearful, we get so stuck here that we stop moving. And even phrases like, let me pray about that, are no longer rooted in faith, they're rooted in fear. Let me pray about it becomes a fear-based stall tactic for not making a decision. So let's talk about God's will. And let's talk about this, this fear that we sometimes have. But if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 2. 
to figure out what God wants for humanity, what God's will is. Let's go all the way back to the beginning when he first created human beings and he set up the world for us. Genesis chapter 2, 8 and 9, 15 to 16. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for what? Food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now skip down to verse 15 of chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now the picture I have here on the screen for you is of Bouchart Gardens in British Columbia. How many of you have been to these beautiful gardens before? Yeah. Several of you, a lot of, I think it's about everybody in first service. Maybe they took a trip together. I don't know. But a lot of people have been here. If you haven't had the chance, it's, it, it just, just make the drive, make the trip. It's a beautiful place to be. And several years ago, we were there, and I don't remember if we had just moved to, to Washington State or it was maybe just before. We were there with Greg and Melissa Howell, who used to be pastors here. And we were walking along a path just like this, just admiring the beauty of the gardens. When I felt a little tough on my shirt and my eldest daughter then three years old little Madeline had picked me a beautiful rose (laughs) and I was able to use the energy of the terror in that moment to master the art of floral arranging in about 20 seconds and I grabbed that flower and I carefully put it back where I thought it should go nice and natural and we went and hid in the Japanese gardens for a little while until we felt it was safe Now, what if we were to reread this Genesis narrative when God sets up the garden? What if we read this as though it were Bouchart Garden? Let's take a look here. Back in verse 8. When God, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring uh, up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and bad for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Down to 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of one of the trees, but the other trees are all death. In Alnwick, England, on the castle grounds of Castle Alnwick, there is a poison garden. I didn't get to go there last summer. I'm hoping to get there someday. I would love to see this place. It was set up by the Duchess Jane Percy of Northumberland after she took a trip to the Medici Poison Gardens in Italy. See, all these things are coming from Italy. Mike would be just thrilled with this. And she sets it up on the, on the grounds. You can go travel there now. And they tell you, there's a big sign there, if you're visiting the Poison Gardens, children must be held at all times. You are not allowed to touch anything or smell anything because everything in that garden can kill you. Things like hemlock. It's fascinating. Plan your vacation now. Take little kids. It'll be a good time. (laughs) But I want you to imagine, what if God had made Eden like this? Think of the kind of God who would say, I am going to create life. And I'm going to put this life in a garden where 99.99% of everything is lethal to them. And then to add in some minesweeper elements, and I'm not going to tell you what you can eat. I've hidden it. Good luck, humanity. Don't die. Is that a God of love or is that a monster? That's sadistic. That's vile. That's evil. That's horrible. And yet that's what we do to God so often when it comes to figuring out what his will is. We picture this God who has given us only one option and everything else will kill us. And whatever that one good option is, he's hidden it. And whatever those bad things are, he hasn't marked it for us. And so quite literally, we will miss the forest for the tree. We will miss the forest of God's abundance for the tree of our own paranoia and fear. And it's not even logical. One example that comes up perennially, this always comes up, especially among youth, among uh, college-age kids who are trying to figure out, who should I marry? I know that God has got one person. God has got that one special person he has reserved just for me. Now, if you realize, if you, if you think that's true, you realize that all it would take is one person in history marrying the wrong person to mess everybody else up. Thanks a lot, Samson. No wonder we're all miserable, right? We all married the wrong person. Thanks because somebody messed it up for us back there. 
we give this restrictive view of God, that God is not a God of options, God is not a God of abundance, God only can give us one thing, and that's it. And if we mess it up, then everything blows up. Our God is so much bigger than that. Amen. Our God is so much more generous than that. Amen. As a matter of fact, God frequently sends prophets when it comes to His will. Frequently sends this group of people called prophets to remind His people of what they already know. God is not interested in playing games with you or hiding things from you. Now, believe me, I believe there is mystery when it comes to worship. I believe that God is holy other, and I believe all that stuff, and that's good. But if there is something vital for you, if there is something that God needs you to do, he's not playing games. He's not trying to hide it from you. God sends this group called prophets, this special gift, frequently to remind God's people of what they already know. Ellen White, somebody in the Adventist church who has a bit of prophetic authority, describes her own ministry this way. She says, if you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain Christian perfection, you wouldn't even need the testimonies. She says, El- she says elsewhere, I'm the lesser light pointing to the greater light that you're not even reading. If you guys had been reading your Bible, it is so clear, I wouldn't even have to be here. <laughs> she didn't always want to be there either if you, read, if you read her history. She didn't always want to go talk to God's people. You already know this. Another great example is the minor prophets. Now, sometimes prophets have a prophetic word, and sometimes all they're doing is reminding God's people of what they already know. If you have your Bibles, go to Micah 6.8. This is a, a familiar verse for those of you who have maybe grown up in church or Sabbath school. This is a popular memory verse we, we share with kids. Micah 6.8. And, and I always read this with a little bit of exasperation when I come across this verse, because usually the prophets are kind of frustrated people. They've, they've, they're trying their best to help people see what, what should be so apparently obvious. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. He's shown you. Some translations say he's told you. He's already told you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. We've already been there and done that. And here it is. You ready for this, for this really complicated thing? Here it is. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. To love justice, to advocate for those who don't have an advocate, to bring in the people on the margins, to give voice to people who don't have a voice, to help people get a leg up who have been beaten up and oppressed and and thrown away by life. Love justice, love fairness. Second thing, love mercy and kindness. There are people who get on our nerves, who deserve to feel our wrath. But we are supposed to love mercy, which means not always giving people what they deserve. Sometimes just being kind instead of being right, instead of winning. God does that with you all the time. And finally, walk humbly with your God, remembering not everything is about you. Other people's personal salvation and life history is not always about and dependent upon you. Earth's history and its future is not always dependent, if ever, on you. So worship God. Jesus summarizes it in the Gospels. He puts it this way. He says, The law and the prophets, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, all of this hinge on these two things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now for conscientious, earnest Christians... They will say amen and they will agree with this. And they will practice it as far as it pertains to other people. I'm happy to be just and fair with all these other people. I'm happy to be merciful with all these other people. I'm happy to love everybody. But they have a hard time directing it at themselves. How are you at being just and fair with yourself? Are you merciful to yourself? Do you love yourself? Because apparently, according to this, we're supposed to love other people as we love ourselves. If we made that application, how well would you be loving other people? Some of the narratives that we play in our head are anti-Christ, anti-gospel, and anti-life. We are so unkind to ourselves. Because we have this picture of God who is just waiting, a God who is just waiting to blow up your life for making one wrong move. And so we just, we just scrutinize everything we do. And don't misunderstand me. There are certainly wrong things to do in life. 
But it, it's been made very clear what we're supposed to do. Just is what you're doing lining up with this? Good. <laughs> Keep doing that thing. But we get to a place that is, that is so crazy with some of the things that we tell ourselves. And here's the thing you have to understand. If you have options in life, if you are making decisions between one good thing and, and another good thing or three good things, praise God you have that privilege. Because not everybody does. Angela's mom visited us this last week and she and my father-in-law John just got back from doing stewardship. They worked for the North American Division and they were doing stewardship meetings over in Moscow, in Russia, and in Romania and Transylvania. I'm really jealous because those are on my bucket list and they got there before me and just had to just watch their pictures online. But one of the things that, that Angela's mom shared with us, she said when John was over there doing the stewardship presentations for pastors, and he would say, here's one thing that you can do with your congregation, here's another thing you can do with your congregation, and here's another thing you can do with the congregation. They said, stop, 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 stop. We, we just need one thing because the way our life works, we're not used to options. So that, that's overwhelming to us. Just give us one thing and we will do it. Not everybody has options like you. Our friends, and you've met them, who've been here, Jay and Raquel in South Africa, when they come here or we, we go there, there's always one request. Can you bring us goldfish crackers? I think we have better things than that in the United States. No, no, no. But you understand, like, sometimes we can find the one kind, but when we go to the U.S., you've got all these flavors. And your Doritos, we have one flavor, but you have all these flavors. You have so many options. If you have options, you are blessed. Not everybody has options. So that's not God trying to confuse you and punish you. That is God abundantly blessing you and you just need to rejoice. Instead of going through some crazy thinking that I've heard some people do, all right, can God use me in, in, in Australia or Tanzania or, or Mexico or Europe or China? If I'm white collar, if I'm blue collar, if I'm old or I'm young, man, woman, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, he can. You know, wherever you are, whoever you are. He can do tremendous things through you. People will ruminate, oh, should I help the orphans in South America or build a well in Africa? Oh, I knew I should have picked the wells. Like, like God is going to punish you, you know, for doing one mission over the other. Oh, God, forgive me for staying at home and raising my kids and not everybody else's kids. And when you really think about it, it's like saying, God, would you forgive me we're not doing what I don't know how to do if we're doing the best of what I know how to do. What kind of prayer is that? That is some messed up theology rooted in a very messed up picture of God. If you read scripture, you discover that God's core, his character, his being is love. First John 4, it says that anyone who does not love, which means loving yourself, which means loving your neighbor, and I hate to share this with you this morning. It also means loving your enemy. Go ahead and take a moment to think about that enemy that you think you have. That person whose theology and ideology and politics is the polar opposite of yours. You have to love them. Otherwise, according to this, you don't know who God is. It's pretty serious. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is what? Now, I believe God is a perfect being. I believe God is the ultimate pinnacle of reality. Therefore, his love is perfect. It's not this capricious love. It's not, it's not flighty. It's something constant and eternal. Ellen White says infinite. Other theologians say, say unconditional. It's this amazing love that all of us who want to follow Jesus and want to follow God, that is the love, that is, that is the, the reality that we orient our entire lives around. And if that is the case, then there is no room for fear. Because if you read a little bit further on, John, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love, Jesus' love, God's love, casts out that fear. For fear has to do with punishment, feeling if, I, if I'm going to make this one mistake, I'm going to go to the wrong mission field, I'm going to take the wrong person out to lunch, I'm going to do this, this wrong good thing over this other good. That is, it is so nuts. <laughs> It's a fear of punishment. Now God, God's saying, look, I've given you so many options today, so many ways you could bless others. Pick one and enjoy it. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, a couple caveats. First of all, God gives us a lot of possible avenues, a lot of possible things to accomplish his will. But you do need to work in a little common sense. If you hate children, don't go work for a daycare. If you hate animals, don't be a vet. If 
if you hate writing and language and communication, please don't write a book to bless all of us. Actually, maybe you should. That might be kind of funny. I wonder what you'd come up with. But you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Use common sense. <laughs> The other thing you have to understand, too, is there is room. There are those rare moments where you have some sort of borderline or total supernatural encounter where there has been a vision or a dream or a healing or an audible voice from somewhere that was clearly based on your understanding of Scripture that was clearly God, and there was fruit to back it up. By all means, please follow that experience as it is written in Scripture. Don't ignore that. But for the most part... Good common sense, guided by these principles of love, justice, and mercy, and walking humbly with God, is good enough. And there will be moments of, of discernment and reflection and quiet and waiting, but don't use that as an excuse based out of fear not to do something for God. I had a professor of mine on the undergrad who said, it is much easier for God to direct a moving ship than one that is docked in the harbor. When the wind of the Spirit is blowing, if you don't have your sails up, if you're not even out there in the water, you know, you're not going to go anywhere. So step out and do something. Be encouraged. You've got a God of abundance and love who's given you options, who's promised to be with you wherever you go. So may grace and peace follow you as you step out and follow Jesus in faith. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on your will and thank you for being a God who gives us a forest and not a single tree. <laughs> thank you for being a God of abundance and a God of life. And while certainly there are moments where we will have to pause and reflect and be quiet before you, so often you are just waiting on us to do what we probably already know we should be doing. Give us the courage and the strength to step out, to know that you are with us, and to do great things knowing that we are in your will. I thank you for all the ministries represented here by each individual, all the things that they will go do this week, and even today, the words of encouragement they will speak, the gestures of kindness that they will give, the moments to share biblical truth with others as they encounter them on their journey at work or school, wherever it is they're going this week. God, help us not to fear you and to fear that you are waiting to punish us or blow up our life around the corner. Help us to fear you in the biblical sense of respecting you and caring about you and, wa and wanting to walk humbly with you, but not out of a fear of punishment. I thank you for the blessings that we will receive as we follow you. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.